Hello and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul with my co-host Dotsie Bausch. Hi, Dotsie. Hi there, Alexandra. How are you doing in these uncertain times? Because as we start to open up, there's even more uncertainty. <laughs> I know, not cool. Uh, it it it's almost feeling weirder than it was like that first couple weeks, and I think it's because in the first couple weeks we were glued to try to understand where this virus came from, what it is, how to not have it, not get it. And um, everyone was kind of on the conveyor belt together, right? We were all We knew like, what we, that yeah. we didn't know. Yeah, yeah. And we had to be careful. Right. And everyone was being careful. And um, But now, as different parts of the world are starting to open up, it's almost like the strange times are moving into even stranger times. And it, it seems like people are... Um, you know, everyone's starting to feel very different about this virus. And I, I feel like it's a really amazing opportunity for us to lean in a little bit deeper to um, just compassion. Mm -hmm. Because I, for one, as you know, am, am not a rule follower. I was not good about rule following at the beginning of this, quite frankly. And my husband was like, uh, get a grip. Like, you've got to put on a mask. You can't go. You know, I was trying to come in here and meet you for the podcast. And you were like, no. <laughs> um, so that's just me inherently. But then I was like, right, I have to respect this. And, and most importantly, just respect other people by wearing a mask. It's just a time that we could lean into a lot more compassion and just recognize that we all are different. So we all have different ideas about this. We have different feelings. And we have different reactions to how we're going to deal with it. And just respect all the differences. Yeah, I think that now that we feel like we know more, we've divided into camps, depending upon a lot of it, the news that each camp watches. Yeah. I'm a, I'm pretty much a rule follower, except for when it comes to the issues that I believe in, like saving animals. <laughs> and I've broken a lot <laughs> the of The rule follower that's been arrested 18 times. <laughs> that's right. It's right here. That's next right. To me. Exactly. I feel like it's this this conversation is an amazing segue um, into our guests because it, it right now it, it really is a time where... Um, the, the the very people who are having, let's just say the most challenging time with this are the very people who have been affected most by it, yeah. right? They've lost family members' lives. They've lost their mother, their grandmother, their sister. You better believe whoever it is in, in the world is going to feel very closely connected to this and following the rules if you've if you've lost someone. So it's it is it is that way. And that's what, what I think we have to respect. And he's a man of great compassion, but also strength. And his name is mm -hmm. Eric Jackson. And he's a social worker. And as you know, social work is not for the faint of heart because no. it takes a lot of empathy uh, to do that job, um, but also uh, a stoicness and an ability to distance yourself uh, from the issue so that you can do the job. Mm -hmm. um, so Eric Jackson he developed his passion for helping people. We'll, we'll learn about this at a young age. And he has harnessed his skills in social work to empower an entire community in Baltimore. And he will he's fighting for food sovereignty and equality within that community in Cherry Hill, Baltimore. But in doing so, he's creating a model for hundreds of other communities across the United States. He is currently the founder and servant director of the Black Yield Institute. He's also worked around Baltimore, helping people get access to healthy food. So we're really um, interested in talking to him today about this issue of food apartheid, which is a term that I actually was not um, familiar with until I started researching. I'd always used the, the term food desert. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk to him also about how important words can be and yeah. the weight that they carry. It's too light. I used to, I would use food injustice and both of those are, are, are not really um, hitting at the center of what this actually is. Mm. So Eric, yeah. Eric Jackson, welcome to Switch for Good. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, glad that I'm able to, to uh, grace the place. <laughs> you yes. are gracing the place. So tell us about <laughs> a bit about your childhood and how it led you to uh, a plant-based diet and a focus on healthy eating. Um, so as you uh, mentioned earlier in the uh, intro, I grew up in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, um, in a small community called uh, Cherry Hill. Uh, the community was developed in the 1950s um, for actually for um, black families. 
uh, particularly uh, those uh, primarily for folks coming home from World War II. And um, my family, after about 15 years that the community was developed, uh, uh, entered the community um, in 1968, actually, uh, a couple of months before uh, the assassination of the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. For me, uh, the community is representative of uh, fight, if you will. It embodies uh, fight. And, and fight in a good way, right? You all talked uh, early on about, you know, at least somebody um, has been uh, arrested several times. I'm not going to say no names uh, <laughs> for, for, you know, standing up for issues. And so I grew up in a community that was very much uh, where the people are steeped in making sure that the people there have everything that we need to sustain quality of, of life. Um, but I also grew up in my uh, my family community, my uh, family in that community. That was just about um, being good people, uh, helping people, and um, that I believe um, is the. I have a, a balance of both of those things. Um, that's fight and compassion, um, and I am uh, I wear that as a badge of honor. Um, I grew up in the community. Um, that taught me how to be resilient, that taught me how to love on nature and love on uh, just people in general. And so I carry that with me um, as a honor to those that I come from, but also because, I, I mean, I think it's a dope way to be. <laughs> um, uh, I, grew, I grew up in a community that, you know, uh, many people uh, would consider, you know, a, a tough neighborhood um, or the hood. Um, and I grew up in my hood, which you can also see. I grew up on the water. Uh, I grew up um, with deer and and possums and and all types of uh, you know different um, uh, parts of creation, if you will, that that um, that I experienced. And so I didn't recognize how much that shaped my life. And so um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up uh, pretty pretty strong. Um, because I was raised by strong black women. I mean, that's just, that's what I come from. Now, speaking of strong back black women, and you mentioned your grandmother, um, mm -hmm. your grandmother didn't eat as healthily, and she 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 died earlier than, uh, you know, she would have if she'd eaten more healthily, and that had a, that had a big impact on you. Um, my grandmother, uh, for all the time that I could remember, had uh, diabetes. Uh, and, and it was really, really, really um, had a really um, important uh, impact on me, but also on her. She was an uh, she she had her I don't even remember now one of her legs um, uh, amputated, unfortunately, mm. um, or at least halfway up to about the knee. Um, and she passed at about at uh, she was 69 years old and um, had a very, very um, it imprinted, you know, on me, um, my spirit and emotionally. And at 14, I only had like an emotional response to it, but it really fueled the work that I do for sure. Mm -hmm. So as Alexandra mentioned, you're the director of the Black Yield Institute and you work towards um, black land ownership, food sovereignty, and addressing food apartheid, um, mm -hmm. which, so we have a lot to dive into on all three of those areas and subjects. <laughs> Um, but yeah. you believe that the fundamental problem of the local food system is racism, is white supremacy. Yes. I would love uh, for us to start with you expounding on that specifically and really go through your definition of food uh, apartheid. Sure. Um, so I'll start with the basis that you start that you talked about. Um, I believe that many of the uh, problems that we find uh, in our um, social systems and structures actually would lead, even interestingly enough, even problems for white folks uh, come down to white supremacy. Um, and, and it shows up, I believe, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear for the listening audience um, and for you all, when I talk about white supremacy, I'm not talking about people with hoods. Um, I mean, that's a part of it. But I'm talking about the uh, system that uh, holds white people, whiteness and white institutions at the helm of uh, defining everyday reality for everyone. Um, and mm -hmm. so I believe that at the 
at the root of what we consider food apartheid is white supremacy. And what I mean by food apartheid um, is um, race-based and class-based um, inequity that uh, has roots in history and that uh, ultimately um, results in uh, limited ownership of land and limited access to uh, arable land and communities. It results in corporate control of our food environments and our food system. And it also results, unfortunately, in the, um, the high uh, incidences of uh, disease and morbidity and, uh, and premature um, mortality. Uh, for people in, uh, particularly black and brown people and poor people in, in the United States of America and I think across the world. Um, and food apartheid, unfortunately, uh, as a historic phenomenon, is to be compared with uh, or compared to what was talked about earlier, that language of food deserts, which just doesn't cut it, uh, doesn't speak to the intentional nature of it. It doesn't speak to um, the fact that it is based on uh, the imbalance of power and not just because people don't have grocery stores or other food outlets. Um, food apartheid is more so about this um, inequitable distribution of power. And this is why people do not have grocery stores are dying prematurely um, and other things. But that is the rest of the things that food deserts speak to are only symptoms of a larger problem. So just to clarify, so <clears throat> what I've heard you say, and I learned a lot from doing research on you, Eric, because I had used the term food desert. And what mm -hmm. you say is that it doesn't go deep enough. Food desert just mm -hmm. infers that there's not a grocery store within walking distance or within a right. comfortable distance, but that it goes deeper in things like um, redlining and the fact that grocery stores are owned mostly by white people who don't want to go into these communities, uh, redlining being that it was a long time when, and please go into this if you like, mm -hmm. that blacks weren't even able to own land because banks wouldn't loan to them, or if they did loan to them, they were under such unfair conditions that eventually the black mm -hmm. landowners and farmers lost their land. Um and and or w they just didn't get a loan at all, so they lost their land. It, it, that that's whereas so whereas food desert just talks about well they're not getting enough food on their plate today. Food apartheid talks more about the whole system, which is the reason people poor black and brown people don't have food on their plates. Am I correct? Yeah, that's I think that's a part of it. I would say um, well first I I use the uh, food desert as well. Um, Food desert was language that I used until I realized, like, hold up. I knew it was always that uh, it didn't sit right with me, but I didn't have language until um, connecting with folks. And I want to be clear that Black Yield Institute didn't come up with this term. We are amplifying the language, but the language definitely has come from uh, from the people across the board. It's come from the people who directly experienced um, food apartheid. Um, but I would say that uh, just to crystallize the point, um, or in hopes of crystallizing the point, that um, food apartheid does speak to the historic nature of it and the intentional nature. But it's, um, I would add to, um, you know, not just like loans and banks, but also policy, the use of policy to actually, um, to disconnect people from their land. Um, and not just policy in the sense of law and legislation, but also other practices um, that we don't often think about. And, you know, um, the original um, policies around uh, homesteading and land grants for universities were a part of that uh, history of either taking land from, uh, from black and indigenous communities and or um, locking people out of the ability to obtain land and utilize the skills that we had to grow our own food or establish uh, homesteads. But redlining in particular in the urban context, uh, starting in the 1930s up until the uh, 1960s when it became illegal, was this uh, tool that were used by banks and uh, other companies to essentially um, to lock in white neighborhoods and white communities and lock in other communities um, and legit uh, folks would put a red line around certain areas to essentially um, uh, 
it was the mother, if you will, I don't want to use mother. It was the predecessor of housing segregation that continues today, but it has its uh, history in these practices. Um, you know, that whole concept of there goes the neighborhood. Yeah. That was the idea. We don't want to, you know, mm-hmm. we want to make sure that, you know, um, that that neighborhoods are clean. And in, in those times and in some cases now, clean means white. And in, in sometimes in, the, in these times, it means white or affluent. Um, it still happens around the country. It's, it certainly happens in Baltimore where on the same street, the same road, um, there are two different neighborhoods and the racial demographics and the social economic statuses are completely different. And the um, conditions of the streets are very different. Just um, I'm talking about miles away from each other. And so it has an implication on a lot of different things, including um, life expectancy as well. Mm-hmm. Can you mm-hmm. can you can you expand on, on how those policies, because some of our listeners might say, well, wait, w- what about those policies? They don't understand exactly mm-hmm. what kind of policies. Were they actually written or were they so subtle mm-hmm. just that real estate agents wouldn't, le- you know, uh, let, you know, let a black family buy into a neighborhood kind of thing? Mm-hmm. It was both and, actually. There were some unwritten uh, kind of social policies that people operated from just because it was the uh, signs of the time. Uh, And then in other cases, there were um, uh, legislation that was uh, developed. And this is around Baltimore is one of those case studies, but in many um, urban, you know, inner cities that we know now uh, in Chicago and Detroit, um, there were policies in particular that... um, one around uh, just tax law and housing uh, housing policy, um, just and it kind of um, in different places did different things. In Baltimore, in particular, uh, created almost like these communities where people legit could not be there. So um, there were also other uh, policies, if you will, that were not uh, governmental policies, but community charters that essentially. Uh, that cemented the fate of communities. Um, Like in Baltimore, unless you have experience, you won't know what I'm talking about, but I'm sure every uh, urban city has a community like this, but there's a community called Roland Park. Uh, The life expectancy um, for Roland Park is 81 years. Uh, And in West Baltimore, um, in another community, Sandtown, Winchester, is about about 50 something years, right? And so, there's a 29 point something, uh, like 29 year gap in between those neighborhoods that are about five miles away from each other. Roland Park, needless to say, is whiter, more affluent, and is one of the communities that had a community charter that essentially said that only people of a certain racial uh, group, and then as it became legal, uh, or illegal to do that, only of of a certain socioeconomic status, could live in that particular community. And so with these kind of practices that cemented the fate of a community, and on the surface, it doesn't sound like it's just you're protecting a community, but what it what it does do is uh, pre- present uh, an opportunity to perpetuate the type of um, segregation that uh, has happened and continues to happen today. Mm-hmm. In, in relation to the uh, terminology food, food desert, you made such a great point that I wrote down. It's just, it does not speak to the intentional nature of it. And mm-hmm. I was recently, I grew up in, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was, rec- I was there two weeks ago. And mm-hmm. I went on a drive with my dad, and we were, um, you know, came out of the area where they live and were driving through some brown and black neighborhoods. And I was so mm-hmm. hyper aware of, I said, Dad, I've never seen so much fast food. Mm-hmm. And that's all that was there. Mm -hmm. I did not see one healthy grocery store. There were like corner stores where you could probably get packaged donuts and stuff like that. And then just fast food after fast food, just zero access to wholesome, fresh food. Um, How does food apartheid show up in your hometown of Baltimore? Um, Mm -hmm. Just just describe what 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 you see and what you feel and the intentional nature of what I'm talking about um, that I experienced in, in outside of Louisville, Kentucky. 
It's interesting um, because it's it's similar to what you were speaking to. Um, not only like the national chains, Burger King, McDonald's, all of those places uh, that are in uh, in communities around, but also a lot of uh, small businesses that are majority owned by uh, in Baltimore. I know it's different in other places, but in Baltimore, the uh, Korean American community and uh, uh, Chinese American community that also has deep legislative roots in the 1960s. Uh, if if it's of interest, we'll talk about yes, that. Yes, yes, no, yes. that's definitely. Um, but yeah, intentionally. Um, so these communities are what we call um, sub shops, right? Mm-hmm. Sub shops. Uh, you can in Baltimore get a chicken box, and uh, for those listeners who are not familiar with the chicken box, a chicken box is just chicken wings and fries um, that you can go. Uh, so uh, chicken spots and lake trout spots, Chinese food. That is largely what you'll see in uh, in communities. So that's how w- one way that food apartheid shows up. And it's not just the presence of those foods, but it's also the other layer that it's not owned by the people there. And so it'll be a different story if the Korean American shopkeepers live down the street. They are extracting wealth and then going to other counties and building their communities and using that same money to send their children to college. Again, on the surface, not necessarily a bad thing. And within the context of uh, a capitalist loving person uh, would say that, like, ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, ain't nothing wrong with going and taking uh, resources from a community and using it for your own. Um, but it does create uh, problems for a community. And clearly, as you can see, I have some thoughts about uh, how business as usual uh, works. But the, uh, another way that it shows up um, is in, uh, particularly in the community where I grew up and actually where I am currently, um, there hasn't been a grocery store for 15 years. Um, and so that is a problem. But also when we start, uh, you know, talking about problems, we presume, and that's one of the other problems with, uh, or uh, I guess challenges with using the language food deserts is that it assumes that the best way to consume good food is through the grocery store. Like that's the only method that you can, um, that you can right. obtain food. Right. Uh, and then lastly, I think one of the less subtle ways that uh, food apartheid shows up is in the ways in which um, food cultures and recipes are not able to transition from one family member to the next because of that uh, um, premature uh, mortality that I talked about earlier, and it creates a void that often gets filled by other people outside of your family and outside of your community. And so um, those are the ways in which it shows up across the country. Um, and some of those ways you can see by looking and other ways you have to be there and understand how um, how it shows up. And I'll just say one last thing. Um, the other way that food apartheid shows up is that um, more colloquial uh, and local, hyper-local ways that people show resilience um, is not really amplified. So for example, um, just because there aren't a ton of good food sources doesn't mean that people aren't getting good food, Um, but often folks are overlooking those because they don't know that, uh, for example, Miss Johnson is selling meals out of her house, or they don't know that somebody opened a small enterprise, uh, cottage industries, if you will, that often get overlooked. And so even when with research studies, when people are looking at, um, you know, what the problems are in communities, we're not often looking at the assets that actually exist and that follow traditions that come from, um, from African-American and African uh, traditions uh, historically. So you mentioned there's was legislation in the 60s that uh, promoted or supported these uh, Chinese American and Korean American stores, but not African American stores. I'd like you to expand mm-hmm. on that. And then I'd like you to answer why hasn't why isn't there a grocery store in there? It would seem to me that a it's a good business move if there's no grocery store to put a grocery For 15 store. 15 years that right. they might need one, right? Yeah. So, um, so to answer the first question, so uh, Baltimore, again, not unlike other places, have had this tradition of kind of having the Im- immigrant class being synonymous with the, the corner store class, right? So you can go to places in New York or New Jersey or what have you. That's kind of been the trajectory. And so in Baltimore, before the 1960s, um, uh, 
well, we call them grocery stores here, but corner stores uh, were owned largely by um, Jewish business owners. Uh, in the community where I'm situated, there were a lot of uh, corner stores that were, or a few corner stores that were owned, even grocery stores that were owned by a Jewish community. There's a very interesting, you know, tie uh, with the Jewish community and black community in Baltimore. Um, but uh, when, um, it's my humble opinion, that when Jewish uh, identity became uh, a white identity, Folks were able to actually, um, you know, um, I guess, get the benefits of, of white privilege, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so by doing so, there is a gap in the corner store class. If you line that up with the immigration acts, um, you had uh, largely Chinese and then Korean uh, immigrants that came to cent uh, urban centers like Baltimore that were then uh, given uh, loans and grants to open these stores so that that so that, that was one of the ways in which uh, people could make a living as they immigrated uh, here to the states and particularly in Baltimore City. Um, so that's one way that this kind of, I talk about this because often there are language and other barriers between um, Black and, uh, and, um, and Korean American or Chinese store owners that uh, does not consider that history. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that uh, city government and state government didn't do a good job of helping people to acculturate and build relationships. And so the uh, children and grandchildren of those African-American folks who live in, in these communities and the uh, Korean-American and Chinese-American uh, uh, immigrants, these uh, first and second generation folks are now figuring out, well, all right, our ancestors and our elders didn't think this through. How do we build relationships and make sure that if we're going to operate in the same community, um, how do we actually build relationships that are healthy, generative, and non-extractive? Because currently it is it is definitely extractive. Um, and so, to answer your, so does that make sense that you have a follow-up? Yeah, so what I'm hearing from you is that because of the, well, what I last heard from is because of the language barrier that the first generation immigrants uh, you know, had with the community and uh, the black community where they were opening these stores, the relationship wasn't that healthy or uh, what well, didn't feel like you were all together working together as a community and that now that's that's changing. I guess my question would be, were blacks not able to open these stores because they weren't allowed loans because of the the redlining that we talked about the mm -hmm. discrimination in the in the loans but the but the new immigrants were because there was legislation to support them yeah i mean and legislation not just i mean and your listeners may when you think about legislation is the stroke of the pen and it's like yeah but legislation in the way of funds and programs that actually accelerated that type of um uh, acquisition of a business license for that kind of store. Um, so the language barriers was one of them. The cultural barrier was the other. And then again, I want to—I don't want to miss the point of the extractive nature. People are not. Uh, people know that folks close their doors, go somewhere else, spend their money somewhere else, and come the next day. Um, and part of it is that people are, um, and when I say people, all types of people are uh, engaging in that arrangement, but folks don't necessarily see that arrangement as extractive because, again, it's business as usual uh, in, I mean, all over the world. I mean, that's just kind of how it, how it operates. And so part of it was that um, uh, it was, an oversaturation of that type of uh, support for uh, immigrant communities. And what about the reason that there's no large no, supermarket so, yeah. that can, uh, you know, have fresh fruit and vegetables? Because these corner stores just have some apples and bananas, as I recall me going into a corner store. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, and even if they have that, right? Um, I mean, it might be yeah. potatoes and onions. If you know anything about the grocery industry, the, the profit margins are slim. And so folks want to go to high traffic locations that allow them to, um, to 
actually make money. And so because that hasn't been the case and there's been the community has been a, a the 90s saw a revolving door of independent grocers, local grocers that come in and then leave for various reasons. I was too young to know that. Mm -hmm. However, uh, as of uh, two and a half years ago, I began working with um, community uh, members in Cherry Hill and South Baltimore and at large to um, lay the foundation for the establishment of a cooperatively owned grocery store in uh, in the community so that we don't have the, to make the business case to someone outside of our community and, and outsource help, but we'll insource it by organizing ourselves to actually meet our needs. And it won't be extractive. So that's... There excellent. we go. And it won't be extractive. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. You're doing so much to change um, that uh, landscape and that atmosphere, and I want to. Uh, I want people to know about your film and 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 know what it's about and, and dive into that. It's called Baltimore's Strange Fruit, yeah. um, and um, you say in there that uh, you're um, you're giving a speech um, somewhere. It looked like it might have had been at a, a local community center or a school, and you say mm -hmm. that there's no way to achieve food equity equity if the people who are directly impacted by the issue um, don't define the problem and then create the systematic solution. And so you're doing that work in Baltimore. I want to hear about um, all about the film and then also how you're creating programs that can be um, replicated in other cities and towns and states and countries and all over the world so that um, this this good work can go forward, uh, you know, outside of Baltimore as well. Yeah, um, thank you for lifting that up. Uh, Baltimore Strange Fruit was a very humble project that uh, was started by myself and a uh, at that time a, um, a student at Goucher College here in Balt in Towson, wow. Maryland. Wow. Um, I did a talk there um, and. You know, I was on this panel and people always ask the question, well, if you're talking about black land and food sovereignty, what's the role of white folks? Um, and That's so one of my questions, my actually. Yeah. <laughs> what do we do? Good, 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 good. So I gave my spiel about that, some of some of which I'll share when you when you Great. get to that question. Um and afterward, uh, Maddie Hardy, who's the, the co-director and pr uh, producer of the film, um, came and got my card, as many people get. If I, if I had $5 for every card I gave out, I'd be, I would be a billionaire right now. But uh, <laughs> she actually returned my call, I mean, or returned, sent an email. We connected, and we began uh, in 2017 um, producing this film. I was clear that I wanted to produce a film that, was both personal and political. And so what we uh, we started planning and we started mapping out how we were going to tell the story, what uh, central character was going to be the thread in the story, which ended up being my grandmother. Uh, this film is an ode to my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother, Edith, Edith Briscoe, who is um, who we talked about earlier in the show. And um, the film just kind of gives commentary from other folks who are doing work on the ground or scholars about this uh, issue of food apartheid and what folks are doing on the ground to address it and to create uh, black land and food sovereignty. So that's what the film is about. And our, our goal for the film was really to utilize it as a tool to bring people together to uh, amplify this language of food apartheid, to dismantle what we consider as Pollyanna language that doesn't help to move the needle, um, and to deepen and build relationships, especially on college campuses and throughout the community to, um, to really build movement toward the Black land and food sovereignty, because one organization can't do it. Um, so that's just one aspect of what we do. The film is a part of, uh, is one fifth uh, of what we do. So Black Youth Institute strategy is uh, five parts. Political education is one of them, and the film is a part of our political education work. We also do uh, research because we uh, assert that we have to tell our own stories, and we have to be the ones lifting that up, um, not only through stories, but also through collecting data and, and sharing our analysis. Uh, we also do that through uh, action network building or, if if you will, coalition building, working with organizations across Baltimore, um, particularly black organizations across Baltimore who are doing uh, food and land-based work. 
And then uh, we also have some projects on the ground. Um, the food co-op that we talked about is one part. And then we operate an acre and a quarter urban farm where we produce food, sell and uh, gift food to uh, our community as well. You're doing amazing work. And in your documentary, someone says, and I'm quoting, black Americans have to get back to owning land. Mm -hmm. And apparently what I learned from you is that the United States used to have many, many more black farmers than they do today. And you'd actually think that because basically uh, black men and women who were slaves kept farms going throughout America. They're the reason that we were such a fertile country. You would think that it would be a natural um, progression that there would be more black farmers. But because of redlining, there there wasn't because they weren't able to own land. Um, But there are other reasons, too, which I found so interesting. And one of them was a, a shame about their plantation past, Um, Could you talk a little bit about, uh, and I have some statistics here about black farmers, um, that there were 14% of uh, the farmers were black in 1900, but only 2% today. Um, And we had a million black farmers in World War I, but now we only have 18,000. So can you talk a little bit about why farming, there aren't more black farmers? Uh, you hit it. You hit it on the uh, the head on the nail. Um, nail on the head. I'm yeah. Sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> um, that I think I think it's uh, twofold. I think because of you know uh, because of legislation, and we talked about that right before redlining. You're talking about you know uh, Jim Crow laws, right? That that um, either gave the rights or permitted. Um, folks to use violence and other tools to get people off of their land. That's a part of it. Um, And in some cases, for real, people just straight up took people's land, not just indigenous uh, peoples, First Nations people, but uh, black people's land as well. Um, And that like that's one part of it. The other part is that, of course, the economy has shifted, and that's why with your statistic about, you know, the number of farmers in world, you know, World War I uh, to now shifted because the economy shifted, but also because uh, agriculture in this country became industrial around World War II, and so you had less smaller farms, more industrial farms that are... Uh, being subsidized in many cases, you know, or their goods are being subsidized by uh, the um, by the United States government, and so people are growing. Y'all know this whole thing about monocropping and all of this stuff, but I'm not going to go into that. But I think that that's the reason for Black folks in particular. I think that you know legislation and then just generational disconnection from the land and from the practices on the land uh, has a, a adverse effect on the numbers of people interested in farming and also just the intentional perpetuation of the notion that the way to uh, succeed and um, assimilate into American culture over time, including now, is to go to college, but not necessarily go to college for uh, agricultural fields, um, but to go to, you know, to to go to college for professional jobs, for white collar jobs. And so um, I think that all of those things uh, speak to that, but also because of the historic um taboo, if you will, around the idea of, um, you know, farming or gardening is slave work, right? So enslaved Africans, there's a part of this narrative, right? Uh, Language also is very important. We don't use the language slave, enslaved Africans. Enslavement was our conditioning. We were not slaves, never. Uh, But enslaved Africans um, were experts and that's a part of the narrative that we're looking to shift how we think about these things. My paternal side of the family is from South Carolina. If you know anything about the Carolinas and Georgia, that was one of the, uh, in the United States of America, the biggest um, uh, production of rice in this country. Where did the people come from? The rice coast, Angola. Coming to this country uh, through forced uh 
free enslaved labor from my ancestors who uh, who um, the colonialists intentionally went there, right? I mean, it was like, well, who can grow this? This land is good for rice. Who can grow rice? The experts. So we have to see it once like that, that we come from experts, that we're not coming from people who are, uh, we do come from people who are dehumanized through a process. All of us have been dehumanized through a process, including white folks. Uh, I'll, I'll take the quick moment to say dehumanization is not just about uh, the creation of inferiority, but superiority as well. In both cases, you are less than human. So it dehumanizes us either way. And so all of that to say that that is one aspect of the narrative, but we have to see ourselves as experts. And as many times as I talk to young people and my peers and elders, I try to remind us of that and tell us that we come from experts. It was because of our expertise that we were uh, that we were traded as uh, as chattel um, to build this this economy. I think that that has something to do with it, but I think that is changing uh, amongst um, the the notion of wanting to produce food as uh, as beginner uh, uh, black beginner farmers, but also farmers that are returning uh, home from uh, war. Uh, uh, farmers that are uh, returning to farming after three and four generations of, of farming and people returning from inner cities to uh, to rural uh, spaces. There are many people who are um, who are returning, and that's of all races, to farming because people uh, recognize that there is a challenge uh, with where our food comes from, the sources, and also the extractive nature of the industrial food system, and folks are returning to the land. What's the, the the separate definitions of being a slave and being enslaved? I heard that loud and clear when you started that, and I think I might know, but what would you explain that? So, I mean, as simple as this, a slave is a person. Uh, enslavement or being enslaved is a condition. We want to be known as the condition because the condition speaks to those who subjugated my people in the position rather than speaking to us um as if that is our stamp or or what we come from. And also it speaks to the history that, again, um, there you'd be surprised in, in 2020 that many people do not know uh, the history of enslavement and its connectivity to the e- economic system that we have right now. And because folks don't know that, they won't know that uh, folks were tools within a larger structure um, that was actually... I mean, some folks might not like me saying this, but it wasn't about black folks at all. Uh, It was about getting the best folks to do the job and to exploit them. It was white folks first. Mm -hmm. Right. We got to get that right. And then it was indigenous folks. And then it was Africans throughout the continent of of Africa. So um, I just want to speak to that. Are you are you saying that first white people were enslaved and and then um, indigenous people and then black? So it's not just about color. It's about the the people they could find for the job. Well, it became about color. Um, yeah. But became... originally, uh, enslavement was about, um, so indentured servitude, right? Uh, indentured servants who were from the poor of people in Europe were utilized for uh, um, the building of colonial America. And these colonies were essentially in the same way that it happens in this country now. Uh, brown people, particularly people who immigrate to this country, are getting paid cents on the dollars for producing our tomatoes and producing other goods in this country uh, for like cents. That's enslavement. I don't care how you call it, what you call it. It's cheap labor. It's slave labor. Um, you know that that is. People won't call it that. People call it good capitalism, but that's just what it is, um, unfortunately. And so um, I want to be clear that it that it was absolutely about race and white supremacy is about race that pre precedes uh, what is colonial America. I mean, in in the film, we talk about the papal bull of uh, 1492. 1493, uh, a policy that comes out of uh, out of the Catholic Church that folks don't often know about that actually sanctioned um, the uh, conquest of other people outside of the Catholic Church. That, I believe, is the basis of conquest of people um, in this dispensation. Now, pe- human beings have been enslaving people forever. 
But in this dispensation of, of uh, imperialism, um, that's, we have to be able to speak to the historic roots of that papal bull. Uh, we should read it in entirety. It's, it's a piece of legislation, albeit religious legislation, is legislation that gave people uh, the okay and sanctioned uh, or permitted, if you will, um, the, uh, the conquest of the feeble minded. That's how you got America in the first place, you know, and that's how you got other, uh, you know, the, the, uh, imperialism uh, throughout the, the world, um, by, by, uh, by European powers. When you say conquest of the feeble minded, are you putting that in quotes? Yes, because yeah. that, that, that is the language that is in papal bull. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, um, conquering essentially or fixing the feeble minded. Part of it was uh, to be done through religion and part of it was to be done through, you know, cultural assimilation. And, you know, anyway, we can have this whole history lesson later. But I think that, uh, you know, the extraction of resources has its history um, during colonial periods, pre-colonial periods, and it and it still exists today. So when I talk about the extractive nature of businesses in communities, it only follows the same model that we've been seeing forever. And so when I talk about these things being connected to white supremacy, that's what we're talking about, including the struggle of of uh, white white women in particular during women's suffrage, and even now, feminists and womenists who are asserting uh, your power. Uh, I mean, I, I also identify as a womanist, not as a feminist, but as a womanist uh, in my politics, as a political ideology. And I mean, if you if you study the history, then you know that it's all connected to white supremacy. You know, everybody's impacted by it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I ain't mean to go on that soapbox, but that's I just like <laughs> that's, one of the, that's one of the, the issues that we find the apolitical nature of this mm -hmm. and the ahistorical nature. We need to be able to follow this and know that we that that when I talk about food apartheid is a part of a thread that is common for what has been in place forever. I mean, for mm -hmm. centuries. And it's only going to continue unless we stop it. Food is just the vehicle. Ultimately, it's about building power. And you and power within the communities that are affected and you you deal in systems, which uh, and Dotsy also through her work with her foundations, with her nonprofit Switch for Good mm -hmm. is dealing with systems like the dietary guidelines. And so, mm -hmm. Dotsy, I'd like to, you to talk with Eric about your mm -hmm. experience before the committee. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, you're you know, well aware that, that, that dairy is a food group uh, for human beings on the Good. dietary guidelines for Americans. And um, in, in beginning my work for um, Switch for Good, uh, like a year and a half ago, um, as I just traversed the entire history of dairy as a food group in general, mm -hmm. um, and then how it got on the guidelines and just the, the whole process I uncovered, uh, which is, you know, not that easy uh, to find or accessible um, that, first of all, 65% of the world's population cannot properly digest, right? The lactose and cow's right. milk because right. the, the lactase enzyme turns off around age five or six because we're not supposed to breastfeed past that. Right. Um, right. And it, it, uh, it, it, it turns off um, in most people, like the, the majority of the population, but in, in people like like white folks like myself, like, you know, Northern Europeans who have been the idiots that have been milking cows for the longest. I have a genetic mutation that kept that lactase enzyme on so that I can digest it now. I'm not lactose intolerant at all. In terms of just America, 36% um, of Americans are lactose intolerant. So if you do the math, mm -hmm. that's 118 million people who are walking around sick, uncomfortable, unable to breathe well, are asthmatic, have itchy skin conditions, diarrhea, bloating, constipation, some pretty nasty side effects from just simply not being able to digest um, the lactose in, in cow's milk. And the mm -hmm. majority of that 36% of people are brown people and, and black people um, mm -hmm. who have traditionally not had this food group in their history, and especially uh, even more so um, Asian Americans in that 36%. <clears throat> um, and so this became something for me that I just, I just was 
just I was so tweaked over that this was the case. I mean, fighting for animal rights, but then to then to uncover this and there's no education around it. It, it is it is in the national it is studies have been done the National Institute of Health and it is sitting there uh, clear as day. This 36 percent, the 65 percent mm-hmm. um, and. The dietary guidelines say absolutely nothing about it. It's making a, making a third of their people sick, and there's no mention whatsoever of why. Last dietary guidelines review, so five years ago, they slipped in soy milk as an alternative to dairy milk if you don't want to have dairy. But no one knows why they wouldn't have dairy. They don't know about lactose intolerance. I can't tell you how many people have written in, oh, I'm finally figuring out what's wrong with my stomach. Children are <laughs> writing in. Uh, that their their mothers, you know, making them have cow's milk. I think that's what's good for them. But they're going to school bloated, uh, uncomfortable, and embarrassed, mm-hmm. probably because they're having gas, right? And, and they're so. I guess um, when I went to speak last summer to the dietary guidelines about this issue, and I leaned in. St- uh, entirely to this problem. I only had three minutes and it was like, this is what matters. I mean, we can go back and forth and back and forth on the health and, 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 and we know that it is a um, saturated fat and that leads to diabetes and, and, and heart disease. But the real issue is that it's making people sick uh, and they yeah. don't, they don't know about it. And, and Dr. Mills, Milton Mills was there with me and spoke on this exact same um, thing. And the committee who I was looking at up on the stage was white people. All of them, white men, couple white women, just, you know, n- n- no representation, which actually um, Dr. Mills brought up to them before he started his three minutes, which was a fantastic moment in time. Like, hello, <laughs> why? So in relation to systematic change, right, and, and a food apartheid and dietary racism at a systematic level, um, I'm just i'm fighting this fight right now uh and 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 just won't stop until this gets taken off the dietary guidelines um yeah, yeah. and and so that was really long sorry about that but uh, what wh- what aspect of this um do you care about the most and work on gosh can we hand in hand in this because it's a, it's going to be a, i have no delusions that it's going to be removed this year but i think we've got a really really good shot in 2025 when the you know 5 years uh, from now when they review it and we have a lot of plans in the ne- these next 5 years to make that happen um, because that that is just it, right there is the central figure of of dietary racism within systems yeah um so i think for me um what I'm most interested in um, and most passionate about is communities being able to do the very thing that you just did and the very thing that I've been doing um, through Black Yield Institute. And that is to, um, one, recognize a problem Mm -hmm. and be so fed up about it and have the skills necessary to actually do something about it, right? Uh, Multi-pronged approaches to addressing it. So like, All of what we do is about building relationships and building the confidence and trust in people who, as you mentioned, the quote from the film, the people who are directly impacted by the issues have to be the ones who lead it, have to be. By by virtue of um, changing power dynamics, you have to. If if, uh, the listening audience have not um, read or are not familiar with Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, um, um, you should. Uh, and I, I, the reason I left that up is because that's one of the central premises of the book. And that is that, you know, by necessity, um, those who are oppressed have to be at the forefront of the struggle for liberation, not the oppressor. It's not possible. Um, it has to be, not to say that folks cannot uh, be a part of the struggle, but they can't lead it. It's by necessity has to. And so I feel like that that's the big piece. Black Youth Institute, uh, the way I see the work, uh, if we were to do this again in five years, it'll be in a different place, not just not on the same on the same trajectory, but because I believe that our basic work is building institutions. So it might be that in five years, those five areas became three because we stood up the grocery store to be its own and we stood up the farm to be its own. Um, I see Black Yield Institute as an incubator of uh, institutions that will uh, be the players, the movers and shakers 
that will move us toward black land and food sovereignty, not just in Baltimore. We're here in Baltimore because I'm I'm here in Baltimore. Our headquarters is here in Baltimore, but we're part of national and international networks to uh, figure out how to do that. And so there isn't one particular lane, if, if you will, but I think that one of the biggest issues is that we, we don't see that atrocities are done to us because our eyes aren't open to it. My hope is to be able to have people have their eyes open, develop the skills that I've been fortunate enough to learn through uh, experience and through school. And folks who will never uh, touch a college classroom or what have you, they should be able to have the same skills, same knowledge, read the same books that I'm reading mm-hmm. uh, and and um come up with solutions for our hyper-local, local, regional, and national, international communities. Mm -hmm. You talked about how folks who are oppressed need to lead the fight because it affects them most directly. But, Dotsie, you you talked to John Lewis, who is a black athlete, very active Mm and activist, um, and he, he said, yes, but we need white people, too, to join the fight because you're in the system. You're accepted by the system. Right. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I, I, yes. I, I was getting some f- <clears throat> some flack I, from a fair amount of people. You know, you, you can't do this. You can't do this because you're white. You're not black. But I was like, but I freaking care. I mean, I, I want to mm-hmm. do something. I'll, 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 I'll do whatever it takes. And I, I went to him to just like as a bit of a advisor and mentor kind of, you know, is, is this right? Can I not do this? Can I, I, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I, I just I'm just freaking pissed about this. It's not OK. And if I can have a voice for whatever reason that it's not. I don't know if it's the white thing or not. It, the Olympic thing seems to get me through the commit. I'll just use anything for justice. Yeah. However, so I have I to get in? there. I'd love for you to. I think that's why she brought it up. <laughs> yeah. So I think for me, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I think what I'll add to it is as an organizer, um, the way that I see this work and the only way movement happens mm-hmm. is through strategy. Right. I'm not. Uh, I guess I'm a millennial. I don't know. I guess I'm a millennial. Social movements are based on relationships and it's based on strategy. All right. So I would completely agree with the point that black people and whatever the issue is that folks need to be at the helm of it. And so and I also agree that white folks have to have a role in it. One, because, you know, I I ain't going to curse on the show, but uh, uh, we ain't getting into this stuff. If you can imagine what I'm going to say by ourselves. Right. And because we didn't get into it by ourselves, we shouldn't bear the brunt. We already bearing the brunt of the problem. We shouldn't bear the brunt of the problem and your white privilege. So because of that, that means that you use your white privilege in ways that are part of the strategy. That's the only thing that I would add that uh, when we are strategizing whatever geographical location or uh, issue area we're working on. Um, when people strategize, the goal should be, um, you know, does he, uh, you can get in places because you are, uh, you know, a, a, an Olympic gold medalist. Okay, go. Right. Because you can go, but let's go knowing that you're going to speak from this standpoint and that mm-hmm. you're going to have. Right. So, like, I think a part of the strategy has to be and the only critique I would have if you were to go on behalf of us to do that. Um, I don't know. Let's just say the U.N. came and you talk on behalf of Black Youth Institute. I'd be like, Dotsie, oh, I love you, but okay. don't do that no more. Right. Because it should be something that we do collectively and collaboratively that is strategic and that is a part of a larger strategy. Um, and that's what organizing is about. Right. And that's what because these issues have been done intentionally, we have to intentionally undo. And in doing so, we should be thinking about at all levels uh, socially. Um, uh, politically, economically, and other levels, how we can actually leverage the resources that we have to change what we deem is necessary to be changed. And so that's the only thing I would add to that. I actually agree. And um, I do think that there's a role of white folks in this work. Part of it, uh, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't mention this. Money is one part of it, right? I mean, there are uh, access to resources and networks that have resources that can support this movement work, right? Because change costs. We know that there's no way around it. uh, There's not any amount of benevolence that's going to change years of oppression. That's not going to happen. So... 
we need to have resources. We need to be able to connect to those networks. And we need folks to be able to um, think about what, particularly white folks, to think about what white privilege has afforded you, white person, white institution, white process, and how can that be used for good if it's of any good? I'm not uh, assuming that just because it's white, it's right. Right. No. I, I got that from some elders. Um I'm assuming that we can go through processes like anti-racism and, and other, you know, uh, training and deeply intentional processes to think about, you know what, we probably shouldn't use that tool or we probably shouldn't use that language. Or we shouldn't probably shouldn't work with that organization or that lobby. Mm -hmm. And I think that that there's room for that analysis. But also, I think at the independent level and the institutional level, um, folks should be thinking about, OK, well, what has it afforded me and how can I be of help? And then instead of going to do, ask in what way can you help or if you can help at all. Okay. And that's a part of that spill that I gave uh, Sister Maddie and everybody else who asked me that question. Um, white privilege has supported, it has afforded you some things. And because it has, um, you could, like reparations and reparatory justice doesn't have to come through the stroke of the pen. The question is, how do you leverage that privilege to support where we are in the way that we need you to do that. And that also requires you a little bit of be like you're at the helm of other people. Uh, that requires you a little to humble your, yourself to a perspective and uh, a commitment to growth. And so, and all of us growing together, right? Cause this is not about, we're talking about healing relationships. We're not, mm -hmm. you know, talking about, I ain't talking kumbaya when I say healing either. I, ain't, I don't mean that, I mean real, deep relationships that allow us to move the needle and move structures, move resources like land and money to actually bend towards sovereignty. And I think that that's the role of white folks. Um, but again, under the auspices and guise of, of us, and I think that I will say this, there is a difference between an ally and an abolitionist, right? Allies are people who are ready and willing to do work, but sometimes change depending on the issue. But abolitionists are people who are actually down for freedom, um, no matter what the issue is, and are, in general, uh, willing to actually do the work to liberate us all, knowing that the liberation of, of one is the li is uh, accounts for and goes to the liberation of others. And so I think that we have to also decide, are you an ally or are you an abolitionist? There's nothing wrong with either way. We just got to know where the position is, right? So um, I think that that is the role for white people. And I think that that is, if, if somebody were to ask me, um, what can I do to help? it will be all those things. First, go right here in your own heart and figure out how you can be supported to this movement work. I appreciate that answer very much. Thank you so much. And, and Eric, thank you for all that you're doing for the community of Baltimore and for the world at large. Uh, we really thanks. appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I thank you all the, for the opportunity to share um, what we do. Uh, I thank you all for asking these thought provoking questions. And uh, if I'm honest, I look forward to uh, staying connected um, and, you know, about our respective works. And um, as we continue to, to trod forward and, and, and get this work done. Sure. I was going to say, but I was going to say off camera, but I'll say you like now you're not going to probably be able to get rid of me. So sorry about that. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I'm glad you feel the same way because I'm, I'm I'm here too. So let, let's do that. Real quick before yeah. we go, how can people find your film? Because they're going to want to watch it. We talked about it. Sure, sure. So uh, if you're interested in uh, viewing Baltimore's Strange Fruit, you can check it out online at bemorestrangefruit.com. Um, you also can, um, and you can purchase it there or you can uh, rent it there. But also um, after COVID-19 is over, if you want to screen the film, you can contact um, me at ejackson at blackyodinstitute.org. And uh, or you can check us out on our Facebook, Instagram, or tw Twitter um, pages at uh, Black U. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. I appreciate the opportunity and I uh, look forward to being connected further. All right. Excellent. We'll talk right. soon. Peace. Peace. All right. <laughs> So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, 
please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to Switch for Good. This is the future.